Hi, I'm Steve Murphy, and this is the Insider Exclusive. Today, we have a special on the San Francisco District Attorney's Office, and we're featuring the managing attorney up there, Paul Henderson. So stay tuned and learn everything that's going on in San Francisco. I grew up uh, in my neighborhood wondering why people in my neighborhood didn't have a voice. Why was it difficult for us to contact the police? Why was it difficult for us to have justice? I wanted people to walk into a courtroom and see me identify with my background and say, he speaks for me, he's going to make sure that my community is safe, he is going to make sure that what happened to me isn't going to happen again in my community, in my home, on my street. I really like being able to say that I am the voice for my community. I love to walk in and say Paul Henderson for the people and know that I represent a segment of society that may not have representation without my presence being there in the courtroom. Today I'm pleased to have with us Paul Henderson, who is one of the deputy DAs in the San Francisco District Attorney's Office, the managing attorney. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Nice to be here. You have an unusual story, and I read a little bit about it, where yeah. you came from a background where you thought you would do more good in the prosecutor's office rather than the as a criminal defense attorney because you would have, I guess the right way to say this, more of a heart, more insight into many of the people that get in trouble. Is that, is that correct? Uh, yeah, that's, that's mostly what it is. I mean, a lot of people uh, focus on the defendants that are in yes. the criminal justice system. And I grew up uh, in my neighborhood wondering why people in my neighborhood didn't have a voice. Why was it difficult for us to contact the police? Why was it difficult for us to have justice? And there's a wider level of disproportionality in the victims that are people of color than there is the people who are prosecuted that are people of color. Explain that a little bit for our viewers. Well, a lot, a lot of the victims yes. themselves are in communities that are people of color and mm -hmm. disproportionately so to the rest of society. So in my community, for example, where I grew up, you know, and I saw a lot of crime and I saw a lot of people doing things that I felt were wrong, that victimized myself, my family, my block, uh, my church groups. And all of those things made me uncomfortable. And I knew I wanted to be a part of it. I wasn't sure how I was going to fit in growing up. But eventually, I wanted to be the voice for those people. Yes. I wanted people to walk into a courtroom and see me identify with my background and say, he speaks for me. He's going to make sure that my community is safe. He is going to make sure that right. what happened to me isn't going to happen again in my community, in my home, on my street. Now, you've been with the DA's office, how long? Wow, it's uh, 12 years now. 12 years. I've been there 12 years. And what do you like most about your job? You know what? It's exciting and it's different every day. Mm -hmm. Every day you're in a different courtroom. Every day it's a different case. Every day it's a different type of crime. Uh, you have a wide range of cases that pr get prosecuted. And for me, I really love going in and speaking and talking and standing up for what I believe is right and standing on the side of justice. Right. Now, I've been told you're the man of the people. I am. Yeah. I am the man of the people. And so my question to you is, do you go out into your old neighborhoods and do you reach out to them? Do you have some connection to the people there so they know that you're there to help them? I do and my office does. One of the things that my office has done is institute a neighborhood DA program. Okay. So a lot of us that work in the office are assigned to specific neighborhoods and for most of us it's the very neighborhoods where we grew up, it's the very neighborhoods where we were active before we went to law school or during law school yes. uh, and where we have families and so people attend their community meetings and at those community meetings are prosecutors that are there to okay. tell them and give them information about what's going on with the cases in this neighborhood. What is law enforcement doing to make your living experiences better? And answer those types of questions. Mm -hmm. And what that process does is that it makes people more familiar with who a district attorney is and what they do. And who they can get in touch with. Exactly, exactly. Because um, there's a disconnect typically with how that process was working. As cities grow, Correct. and as urbanization goes on, we have more of a gang problem. Yeah. Okay. You work with gangs, you work with graffiti uh, yeah. organizations and that sort of thing. 
how do you steer young people who all around them in some of the bad neighborhoods see there's an easy way to get by, you know, by selling drugs, by getting involved with crime? How do you steer them away from that? I think one of the ways that we have to address that problem is try and institutionalize through schools, through church groups, through neighborhood organizations, mm -hmm. other alternatives. I think oftentimes people turn to crime and they turn to gangs when there aren't a lot of alternatives in their neighborhood and unfortunately, disproportionately, uh, that takes place in the lower socioeconomic neighborhoods yes. where people don't have the resources, they don't have the community groups, they don't have the park and recreations, they don't have a lot of these other alternatives mm -hmm. and so they end up making bad choices because they're not exposed to other types of choices that are going to be beneficial to them in the future and for their neighborhoods. Well, you know, like when I grew up, there were the Boy Scouts. There right. still are the Boy Scouts. And boys um, and Girls Clubs. Boys and Girls Clubs. How do you channel the kids so that they get away from, and I've had Chris Darden on these shows, yeah. you know, and so I was, I was asking him the same question. How do you channel them away from their peer group goals of having nice wheels and having a lot of money and, you know, being a hip-hop singer and that sort of thing? How do you, how do, you do that? How do you offer the alternative to say, you got to work hard, you have a nice career, you'll enjoy your life? I think what it, it uh, focuses, I think what the focus should be on mm -hmm. uh, in situations like that is exposure. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it's really difficult to ask kids from those neighborhoods and in those environments, what do you want to be and what do you want to do? Because the people that they see as they define success aren't necessarily the best role models. Yes. And too often times they'll tell you something like, and you know, I worked in juvenile law for quite a long time, really trying to understand that dynamic. Uh, and when you talk to them, they'll tell you things like, uh, I want to be a rap star or I want to play basketball professionally. Yes. And they say that, I think, because that's what they identify with from someone with their background. With their heroes. Right, right. Yeah. because that's the model of success that they know. Right. But that's because they're not exposed to and they don't know people like you and I. Like you. Or people that have gone to medical school or people yes. that have become scientists or people that are working in technology that have become successful. And there's a disconnect between connecting those communities to those professions. And that's why I think you have such limited views and values from young people and making bad decisions. In um, Los Angeles, we have a big gang problem, and it seems to be growing. And not just L.A. And, and probably in San Francisco. Yeah. You know, when you have a kid, and I've seen, you know, uh, MSNBC reports where, yeah. you know, I, I'm a Vietnam vet, and I never was in touch with violence until I went to Vietnam. Yeah. And I understand, you know, combat, I understand that, but when I see young kids, you know, like 16, 17, 15, you know, wielding guns, shooting people without even thinking about it, what do you do with a kid like that? I mean, do you lock them up and throw away the key? Is there any hope for some of these kids? I mean, this is terrible mess that, you know, is in society today. I think there is hope, especially with uh, younger kids. Mm -hmm. um, and and, and the, you actually raise a really important issue because here's what I think a lot of people don't recognize or are prepared to deal with. When you lock someone up that's 15 and you say, this is a bad person and he had a gun and he made a bad decision, yeah. You know, that's not the end of the story. Like it or not, more than likely that individual is going to be coming back out of an institutionalized setting. And where do you think he's going to go? He's back coming to your neighborhood. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Right back to your neighborhood. And now someone has had him institutionalized for 5, 10, 15 years, however the amount of time is. And, and I think that process is what people forget about. They don't realize that someone once they're incarcerated is not the end of the story. They're going to be right back there again. So unless we find a way to intervene and actually do rehabilitation, either while they're in custody or while okay. they're transitioning back to the neighborhood, you really aren't going to change those values. They really right. aren't going to be different people. They're not going to be surrounded by people that have different values and change how they think about what their role is going to be in that society when they come back. What amazes me is when I grew up, uh, the worst kids were called hoods. Right. Okay. Um, the worst weapon they had was a switchblade. Today, you have kids with Mac 10s, you have kids right. with AKs, you have kids, and, and they use them indiscriminately, and it's amazing. I mean, it seems like the conscience, the morality has disappeared about how, when you harm someone, that it has no responsibility. And a lot of that, I think, is due to groupthink. You know, it's when you, when, the time that you're talking about is when a lot of times crimes were more individual. Yes. And as the gang culture grows, the culture that grows along with a gang culture is a culture of violence. And people and communities are 
introduced to that type of violence at a younger and younger age yes. as they bring in new members and so it changes and it shifts the perception of what real violence is and it changes and shifts what the what the perception is of you know picking up a rock and throwing it versus picking up a machine gun yeah. and keeping a machine gun yeah. you know it, it it's changed because everyone else is doing it and that's the model that's what you're following let me ask you this question uh money is derived from selling drugs absolutely and they use that money to buy guns absolutely. and a variety of other things right you know there's a lot of debate in our society today about whether drugs should be legalized or not and we have a whole industry you know that's making sure that it were, never will be legalized okay right what is the solution here? I mean, should some drugs, and I know you're an assistant district attorney, and I don't want to put you on the spot, but... <laughs> but you are. <laughs> yeah, but, but the bottom, there's got to be a solution. You just can't keep locking, you know, with, a gut, with, a, with the gang enhancement, right. you know, uh, penalties of some putting someone in jail and throwing away the key forever. Right. You know, what do you do? What do you, how do you solve this problem? How do you take the money away from them so they don't have the power? Okay. Well, here's what I think, and this is my opinion. And this now, is I'm not asking opinion. about the drug right, situation. Right. I'm saying how you take the money away from them. Uh, I think it's really complicated to work on just the money aspect. Mm -hmm. You know, I think you have to take a step back and look at the bigger picture. Obviously, we have all sorts of laws focused on taking the money out of criminal prosecution yes. uh, from gang members, from defendants, from criminals and who use But that's drugs. after the fact. It's, it's, it's after the fact, but it's not really because it's part of the prosecution process. Mm -hmm. And so when people are arrested uh, for drug sales, let's say, and they're found with 10 pounds of crack cocaine or heroin or whatever it is, and there's also $10,000 in the house. You know, they seize those assets, and that's standard practice for right. prosecutors in most jurisdictions anyway. I think the real solution to addressing those issues is once again about indoctrination and changing people's perception of this is how I can make money. Yes. You can still make money in other ways. You can still be a part of society. You don't have to work outside of the laws of society and work against your own community in order to get money by right. selling drugs. That's not the model of success, and that's what I think we all need to start focusing on. In California, our prisons are filled, and it doesn't seem to be getting any better. Right. What do we do here? I think the model for the future is going to be shifting in criminal justice mm -hmm. and moving more closely towards uh, boutique models, um, treatment models uh, indoctrinated into the criminal justice system. There is a diversion program, is there not, for first-time offenders or first-time possessor possession, isn't that correct? There are, and, and I think some of the diversion programs are good, but I think the criminal justice model needs to expand to include more models and not just for diversion, because diversion isn't going to be appropriate for all types of crimes. Right. Um, the, the reason I like the boutique model so much and the reason that I think it's worked really well uh, in San Francisco and mm -hmm. the jurisdiction where I serve uh, is because it really does address some of the individual needs and community specific needs of crimes to try and make sure that those crimes don't keep occurring, that we affect recidivism rates uh, okay. in our communities. I read in your bio that you go around the country, I believe, and you meet with other prosecutors' office and you give them, you know, a whole new way of looking at things and implementing more successful fighting crime programs. What are these programs? Well, a lot of them are um, intervention models, and like I said, a lot of them are based on boutique courts with the Department of Justice, and yes. people can apply for grants to incorporate some of those models in their communities. And really what it does is it starts by a focus, uh, the area that I specifically train in and lecture on, mm -hmm. specifically focuses on models of drug addiction mm -hmm. intervention. And, you know, because oftentimes these are the individuals that are the highest recidivists, the people yes. that come through again and again and again. And the regular criminal model just does not work. You can't say, I'm just going to put you in custody and that's going to stop your cocaine addiction. Right. We're just going to intervene in your heroin addiction. And I understand there's some, um, there's diversion programs in prisons, but I understand that there, some people are ineligible for them because, let's say, they were convicted of a crime of violence. Correct. Now, this kind of defeats the purpose, right? One of the reasons one of the reasons that they may have committed this crime of violence was because they were drug addicted or they were high on something. In fact, probably most crimes are committed by people who are high on alcohol or drugs or whatever. Correct. And I really think that you need to start distinguishing crimes of violence versus uh, other types of crimes. You really have to be, as my jurisdiction really tries yeah. to be, my boss Kamala Harris, 
uh, this is a quote from her, we have to start being smart on crime. Mm -hmm. And so you can't... Differentiating the types of crime. Exactly. That's exactly it. You have mm -hmm. to really differentiate how types of crimes are treated. And that's why one specific model isn't going to work. You really need to start breaking down domestic violence crimes. Yeah. You really need to break down drug, drug crimes. You need to break down gang crimes mm -hmm. and really try and address them directly and have different models of intervention to try and make sure that these people aren't coming back to their communities and creating more havoc. Right. Um, there was a movie recently called The Zodiac Killer. Yeah. San Francisco. Based I remember it when I was younger. Okay. Uh, how come that case never got solved by your office? Well, it wasn't necessarily <laughs> my office specifically yeah. that was responsible for Was it the San Francisco office? It wasn't San Francisco, but it's yeah. not just the district attorney's office. I mean, the, you know, because here's the thing. Yeah. Criminal justice is a collaborative. Yeah. So it's not just the DA, per se, that didn't prosecute a case. It's also the police that are still, con still to this day, conducting an investigation. Right. I know part of the whole Zodiac release uh, the police and the law enforcement community is eager to re-issue re, uh, these uh, topics to the public in mm -hmm. hopes of getting more leads to try and uh, find out who was actually responsible for those murders. It's, right. it's, it's a big collaborative. I don't think there's one specific agency right. to blame. It's just no one has been caught yet, but I know they're working on it. Getting back to when a person is released from prison, yeah. he came from a bad neighborhood, he probably dropped out of school or whatever. Yeah. Today, if you're convicted of a drug crime, you are ineligible for student loans by the federal government, which right. now you've thrown a wrench in how this person can rehabilitate. rehabilitate. Yeah, absolutely, because how the heck are they going to learn a new job if they don't have the money, you know, to, uh, you know, to learn a new trade? And that's, that's, you know, what is this? The state of California has a problem with the prison system. Too many people, okay? So my question to you is how does the state of California attempt to solve this problem? I think the way that they attempt to stall, solve that problem, and first of all, one of the, the things that you brought up is actually a federal issue. Yes. But one of the but things the that I think... has a state problem. This, right, because they're in yeah. the custody of the state most often. Yes. So one of the things that I think, personally, uh, that the state should do is try and be more proactive in providing educational loans and educational programs to people who have been incarcerated mm -hmm. separately from relying on those individuals to seek federal funding after their release. Good point. Who's doing this? Well, well I, legislators are doing this. Legislators are doing it. Individual prosecutors' offices are doing it. Are they? Uh, in my office, we have a program back on track that Kamala Harris has introduced in her jurisdiction, which really addresses those specific types of issues and introduces topics such as vocational training for mm. people. And provides funding for it? There is funding for it. It's okay. limited funding, and obviously we're trying to expand some of those programs, but mm -hmm. there is funding for some of those programs, and I think that they will serve as the model for the future for other jurisdictions trying to address that problem. How does the San Francisco District Attorney's Office stand apart in terms of their attitude towards prosecution, in terms of their record of successful prosecution of crimes, and reducing recidivism of the people that they prosecute? Well, I think they do a number of things, and like I said, the big picture of that is trying to be smart on crime mm -hmm. and trying to address criminal prosecution from a perspective of informed prosecution. You make recommendations to the judge. Absolutely. Based on this being smart on crime. Correct. Are the judges paying attention? Well, you know, <laughs> well, I, I, no. I'd love to say, right, I'd love to say... Do you want to name any particular judge? Yeah, right, right. <laughs> I'd love to say when we I walk you on the spot court, here, don't worry. I, right, exactly. <laughs> I'd love to tell you that when yeah. I walk into court and tell the judges what I think they should do, everyone stops and listens. Yeah. But <laughs> that's not really how it works. You know, it's an adversarial system, yeah. uh, and San Francisco is a liberal environment, so there's always a defense attorney, and oftentimes, surprisingly enough, uh, they don't agree with my perspective and mm -hmm. my opinion, shocking as that may seem. Mm -hmm. uh, and then a judge ultimately is going to decide when there's a conflict uh, but I think we're moving towards models where we're working more closely together to make sure we have the right resolution. So, Good. What are the major crimes that you prosecute right now that well, you handle? Well, I specifically now am the co-manager of one of the trial divisions. And so a lot of what my focus has been recently is on trying to address and intervene in quality of life issues. Because I feel like it's one of the areas where there's been a gap. Mm -hmm. uh, where people don't think it's, there's been a perception that that's not real crime or it's not as important. Uh, and it's really the base of 
a number of crimes that evolve. So issues like uh, homelessness and aggressive panhandling, issues like graffiti, issues uh, like prostitution. Um, these are the types of things that uh, I'm trying to focus on and revamp the way that society deals with those cases and tries to address needs at the base level, the street right. level. Those are actually the crimes that most people are familiar with. Taking the issue of homelessness in yeah. San Francisco, what is the attitude of San Francisco towards the homeless people? Well, I think uh, people are very compassionate in yeah. the Bay Area, and people want to help. At the same time, people don't want to feel victimized by homeless people sure. and feel like, I can't live my life because other people are around me mm -hmm. that aren't respecting the same rules that I am. It's difficult to run a business when there's human feces outside of your door, sure. when there's urine in the hallways, when uh, there are people sleeping in your driveway. And we have to try and find a way to address those situations and address that population in a way that's both compassionate, that's smart on crime, that's going to make everyone's life better for their interaction with the criminal justice system. So that's kind of what my office is trying to do right now. Um, in some of the other areas, like for example, aggressive panhandling, yeah. what do you, is that a crime that's, in, that's enforced? Punishment it, is enforced on there or what? It, well, it is enforced and it's the kind of thing where people feel uncomfortable in their cars when they're at like an intersection sure. and someone is standing less than a foot away, you know, with a sign or with their hands out yes. asking for you know, money or handout, it makes people uncomfortable. And there are laws and rules to protect that. One of the things that we're trying to do and one of the models that we're trying to move in the direction of is trying to incorporate uh, rehabilitation and punishments to address those specific individuals because it doesn't make much sense for us to say the crime for that is a hundred dollar fine. Well, you know, a lot of these, uh, these crimes, uh, people are homeless already and they mm -hmm. don't have a hundred dollars anyway. So they end up going to jail they either end up going to jail or not doing anything and having mm -hmm. bench warrants. I think the best model, me personally, is to try and come up with an intervention such that when these people are brought into the criminal justice system, convert those fines into community service at a homeless shelter. Mm -hmm. And so now you're lowering the cost of a homeless shelter yes. and they're contributing their work to help that homeless shelter grow or sustain itself and then it ends up giving back to the community in a way that helps everybody. One of the reasons people go into the district attorney's office is because they want to get that trial experience. Yeah. You've got 12 years of trial experience, okay? Question is, do you see yourself going into private practice sometime in the near future? You know, I don't know. I really love doing what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. You know, I really love representing the people. Never without work. I'm never without work. Mm -hmm. There's always work. Uh, I really enjoy being in the trials. Uh, I really enjoy being in the court system. And I really like being able to say that I am the voice mm -hmm. for my community. I love to walk in and say Paul Henderson for the people and know that I represent a segment of society that may not have representation without my presence being there in the courtroom. Mm -hmm. How many like-minded assistant DAs in the office like you? I think all of them. Right. And you know, it's the kind of job where you certainly can make more money mm -hmm. doing other things. Uh, you certainly have a lot of options once you've built up your trial skills to go into private practice or do something differently. Right. We've you, seen you often on national TV, yeah. Fox News. There, you know, you're commenting, com commenting on uh, various cases and that sort of thing. Um, what are some of the cases that you see out there? If you were on the spot right now, like uh, we've got a murder trial going to Phil Spector down here and that sort right. of thing. What are some of the cases that you might be called upon an opinion? For example, right. the dog food. Case. Yeah, <laughs> uh, that, that would be one that yeah. I might be called on. Uh, recently, I'm doing a whole lot of celebrity stuff. Is that right? Yeah, I don't know how I turned into the celebrity guy. Commenting on like... Anna Nicole, Nicole Smith, Smith, Britney Spears, mm -hmm. O.J. Simpson. We had, uh, let's see, we had the publisher of a book that's coming out by, his, by her sister. Are you aware of this? I know about the book. Yeah, the book is coming out. It's supposed to be telling, you know, the real truth. It's unauthorized yeah. and all this other sort of thing. It's a real travesty. All the people that yeah. were surrounding her that, you know, either So let's, let's make some comments here. Howard K. Stern. Okay. Yeah. What kind of guy is he?
Your opinion. You're not going to be sued. Right, right. Of it's your course, opinion. Of course. Entitled the famous opinion. last words. <laughs> uh, I think, you know, I think people are going to start looking at Howard K. Stern and really evaluating the decisions he made and his association with Anna Nicole. Yeah, and like why? Motivation. His motivation yeah. and people are going to want to know you how much like he it. knew and how much he may have contributed to yeah. her use of illegal substances yeah. or misuse of legal substances. Exactly. Uh, you know, there's been a lot Does of... Does he appear to be a Svengali to you? He doesn't seem that way, does he? I, 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 not and not yet he had, a lot, he had a hold over her. Well, I don't know if he had a hold on her, if he had a relationship with her. Yeah. He certainly had ties to her that were long-lasting, and I think that throughout the time they were together, their relationship changed back and forth. We all watched it like a train wreck right. when she had her Us. reality TV Unfortunate. show. It was very what much... What are some crazy. of the other celebrity cases you're commenting on these days? Uh, you know, I'm doing a lot uh, with Britney Spears. Okay. Uh, people want to know what's going on with her divorce. With her divorce. That's um, final, isn't it? Uh, I don't know if it's final yet, but... Mm -hmm. it, Let's not hold our breath for that not to take place. I think it's going to happen. Right. Uh, but people also really want to know what's going to happen with their kids. People want to know who's going to take care of them, what sort of custody arrangement is going to be worked out, mm -hmm. and what type of care they're getting while she's in the tabloid, shaping her hair, going to parties. Yeah. Uh, you know, really not necessarily Unfortunate. Like Too much money and nobody guides you, right? Right. Or maybe there's guidance and they're just not listening to it. You know, these are adults and they make their own decisions. And just because people are stars or happen to be famous mm -hmm. doesn't make them smarter than you and I or make them make better decisions. Right. The mayor of your city was in the news recently. Yes. And um, what, do you, what, what, do you, what comments do you have to say about being in the news recently? Uh, I have very few to say. <laughs> I, I think Gavin is a, a smart guy yeah. and a really, really hardworking mayor. His, is it his ex-wife? Yes. Or his wife, his ex-wife, used to be with your office, didn't she? Yes, she was. We were very good friends in the yeah. office. And now she's all over the TV, right? She has a really good show yeah. uh, that uh, I appear on uh, pretty frequently, and I love the work that she's doing. She's very a great investigative, person. huh? It is investigative. Yeah. Uh, it's interesting stuff. I really like that she came from a background in the criminal justice system right. such that it gives her insight when she talks about leading cases that are big and in the news and right. are in the headlines. And I would say she's one of the smarter ones on TV without naming any right. names. Right. Yeah. And there are some I avoid. All right. Now, <laughs> well, do you have yeah. a website where people can find out more information about your office and everything you're doing? There absolutely is a website. And if somebody wants to get a hold of you because they have a question, they've been a victim in the community, they can call you at the office. What's the general number? 415-553-1752. Uh, mm -hmm. And we have people always available, okay. ready to hear those stories and help uh, do what we can. Well, I want, you, I want to thank you very much for joining us on the show today. Thank you so um, much for having me. I want to learn more pleasure. about what's happening with your model of the San Francisco District Attorney's Office because yeah. you're, you're a prosecutor with a heart. And well, I think people need to know that. That's smart on crime. Okay. Thanks for being <laughs> Thank with you us. so much for having me. It's okay. been a real pleasure. You're welcome. Thank you for joining us on the Insider Exclusive. You can see more of these shows at www.insiderexclusive.com. I'm Steve Murphy. I'll see you next time.